Many of you know that uh, when a priest or a deacon is ordained, that he distributes sometimes a, uh, what's called a holy card. I think that's pretty poorly named considering he hasn't done anything yet. So we in seminary called it our rookie card. Um, and uh, you have to choose a verse in some way that describes some verse that you're passionate about or some way that you want to live your priesthood. And there was a seminarian uh, before. This could be legend, uh, but uh, when he made his holy card, he put, too weak to dig, too proud to beg, ordained a priest, 2014. Because he's trying to answer the question of, how will people welcome me into their homes? He's not just some sort of traveling Bible salesman or something. He wants to proclaim the truth, and uh, by becoming a priest, he's hoping to be a prudent and wise person. This guy, I don't believe, was very wise. He sounds like a wise guy. And he's doing what's in the best interest of himself. It says that he uh, is brought before the master because he was known for squandering his property. Now, some people would read this story from the gospel and say, oh, he's changed his ways. Look how wise he's become. I don't think that the master hired this servant back. It says that he commended him for his prudence. The master commended that dishonest steward for acting prudently. But then Jesus goes on, For the children of this world are more prudent in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. He knows how to win friends and influence people. This guy who was acting in this way, was only interested in ensuring his own safety, his own security. And so he goes and he makes this deal with these persons. Now, you have to remember at the time that uh, Jesus is proclaiming these parables, there are no quick books. There's no Excel spreadsheet. Paper even is somewhat hard to come by. So the one who keeps track of the debts for, the, for the, the master of the house is the steward. And the steward is the one who knows all of who are the persons that are supposed to pay back what they owe. And so when he gives them their promissory note, the master has no record of what was to be, what was uh, the proper debt that the person was supposed to pay. So when he says to them, how much do you owe? And they say, well, I believe it's a hundred and he says, sit down and write one for 50. The steward is the one ultimately who knows the truth of how much they owe. Now, my guess is this steward isn't just saying, well, your real debt was for 50. He probably was skimming off the top. But my guess is it wasn't, it wasn't 50. It might have been around 60. Because he's going to lose his job. And he wants to give them a discount Instead of stealing from them, he wants to steal now from his master. And so he says, quickly, write one for 50, or if they owe, you know, 100, write one for 80. And the master commends the steward for acting prudently because he's trying to save his hide. He's working hard to ensure his own security. Instead of just doing what is right, instead of doing what is just, as he should have been doing all along, He makes this real strong effort to save himself at the very end. But he doesn't save his job. He finds a way to get in with all of these other persons, but he's still not working for the master. I say this because I have seen, both in myself and in others, people go to great lengths to not do the right thing. But they want to do the right thing, but it's just not convenient at the time. And so they'll work and finagle away so that they can kind of appear that they're doing the right thing, but ultimately not being doing the right thing. Okay? I will go first. I will admit my fault first. And then you can kind of come up in your own mind, your own thoughts of how you do this. So when I was a kid, and I think I was with my brothers and sisters, we were left at home and old enough that we could take ourselves to church um, and our parents said, remember, while we're gone, you got to go to Mass. Yeah, yeah, Mom. So they leave, and then we're like, all right, 
we've heard of this legendary way to get out of going to Mass. You know what this is? You get the bulletin. It's like the treasure map, right? You've got to somehow secure the treasure map. You somehow somehow have to secure the bulletin. Not be seen by everybody. Appear that you're going to Mass and uh, you get extra time. You don't have to sit through Mass. By the way, this does not work, right? And on behalf of myself and Father Matt, I would want to tell you, you do need to go to Mass. This is not a good idea. I'm telling this story. I don't even know. I think I've confessed this, so you know, don't freak out. My salvation, I think, is secure. Um, but uh, it, it doesn't work, right? But we tried it. But we, had, we, we spent hours the night before and the morning of planning, okay, do we, there's only two Masses. Do we go in the morning Mass? Do we go in the later Mass? Do we go in between Masses? If we go too early, we're going to get nabbed because they don't put the bulletins out until late. Uh, if we go too late, Father O'Shea could lock the door, and then we're not going to have any bulletin, and are our parents even going to believe us? And we spent all of this time until finally we said, all right, we're going to go in between the two Masses. We'll go in... We'll go in, we'll grab the bulletin, make sure we're seen by a few people, and then get out. And so we go, and you, you couldn't just have one of us, we had to have multiple of us. So we all go in secretly, you know, and who sees us? Gene and Sandy Nicholson. And they said, oh, your parents are out of town. Do you guys want to sit with us? Dang it. <laughs> Crazy old Gene and Sandy Nicholson ruining everything, you know. And we spent all of that time scheming and trying to figure out a way to get out of doing what we should have just done easily, what we should have just done normally. Now, you may say to yourself, I, Father, like, I never do this. Okay? All right. One small example, right? How many times have you had somebody say to you, hey, would you like to do something with us on uh, Friday night? And it's like, I don't want to do anything with you on Friday night. I'm busy. I don't want to do it, but I don't want to tell you I don't want to do it. So I say, I'm, I'm, I'd love to. I can't. I already have plans. And they're, oh, okay. No problem. Then in the course of the conversation or with somebody else, they say, hey, I've got two tickets to the game on Friday or to the concert on Friday. Do you want to go to that? And you're like, yes, I do, but I can't because I have that thing, right? Now, all of a sudden, you've told this little lie that now has to grow because it has to cover a multitude of sins. If we just told the truth, it's really just not a good day for me. I, I would love to do it in the future. It's just not, just not going to work. Yes, you're probably going to disappoint them a little bit, and, and maybe you, they're going to see you as, what, are you just waiting for a better deal? But if you're just honest with them, then it's just done and over with. Instead of, I've got to come up with this huge story that's going to cover all things. So I still appear like I'm a good friend and open to going to dinner with them when I really don't want to go to dinner with them or go to the whatever with them. If we just focus ourselves on doing what is right, it's going to be difficult. The Christian life isn't like easy, always downhill. You're never going to have any problems. But sometimes we try to find shortcuts through for the Christian life and just say, I know I want to do this, but I don't, so let me find a way around it. Usually that doesn't work. Anytime you try to blaze your own trail, you end up with those like burrs on your socks and it's just, it doesn't go well, it takes longer, you're muddier, you're crankier. You should just do what is right. Similarly, in our first reading, we hear that they're not affixed, their minds aren't tuned to just taking rest. Not just doing what is right or doing what is holy, but just taking rest. They don't even want to do that because their minds aren't trained to uh, finding joy in the Sabbath, but rather, why can't we just make more money? Why can't our hearts just be filled all the time with what we really want. We have to wait until the new moon is over for us to go back to doing what we really like doing, which is making money. So on the Sabbath, we're going to scheme and dream about how much money we're going to make the next day, which actually would be Sunday. Jewish Sabbath, Saturday, Sunday, you know, Monday. How many times on Sunday are we already focused on the work week? 
How many times on Sunday, instead of taking rest, we just say, I just got to keep working? I had a conversation with somebody who worked in the industry that was affected by blue laws, um, and I said, is it good for you to be open on Sunday? And they said, in fact, no, it's not good. We think that it's great to have all of these businesses open all the time, but it's harder for them. They don't make as much money. They don't get a rest. They have to make sure their employees are there or they have to be there. And it's not even that big of a sales day, but if you're not open, then people get frustrated. I'm sorry, I didn't mention this, you know, the other day. I'm pretty sure Chick-fil-A is doing just fine closed on Sundays. All of us are dreaming about Chick-fil-A on Saturday, only to our distress. And then on Sunday, that'll be the only thing that I allow you to dream about on Sunday. If you're already thinking about Chick-fil-A today and planning for tomorrow, go ahead, right? But if we're just focused on how can I get mine, how can I ensure mine, we're not actually focused on that which matters. Jesus goes on. He says, if therefore you are not trustworthy with dishonest wealth, who will trust you with true wealth? If you are not trustworthy with what belongs to another, who will give you what is yours? No servant can give can serve two masters. You either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon, both God and riches. If we're looking to be filled by something, one day of the week, we actually abstain from everything that the world has to offer and just say, I'm going to fill myself with real delight in God, in community, in a simple meal prepared for each other, or an extravagant meal prepared for each other. I don't have anything planned other than being with you. If our hearts are drifting to somewhere else, we can't be present to where God is placing us right now. He wants to fill us. If we're never never satisfied with what we've been given, how will we ever be satisfied when God actually gives us what we truly want? Today, we hear of this story of the the steward who's commended for acting prudently. If we ourselves aren't acting prudently with what God has given us, how are we going to recognize true wealth when it's been given to us? Today, we close the books. I mean, and truly, this this homily is for you. Everyone else in the Denver metro area is concerned about one thing right now, okay? Their minds and hearts are somewhere in Wisconsin. You're here. Now, you may be DVRing and whatever else. God bless you. You are focused on true wealth. God wants to impart that to you. You cannot serve two masters. You are present today. You've closed the book on the week and allowed God to fill you this day. May you who have presented the Lord your hearts be filled to the brim with true riches. Amen.